That's kind of cool. Okay, with that, let's welcome Dr. John Dunfield. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be here in Estes Park. I've actually tried to get to Estes Park a number of times to live, uh, because between, I grew up in Chicago and uh, started rock climbing and then mountain climbing, and, Lumpy Ridge is about the closest place to doing kind of real quality rock climbing close to Chicago. And so I drive out here with my high school buddies, and then I went to graduate school at the University of Chicago, and this became a go-to place, uh, you know, when I could. Then I got married, and I said to my wife, and she's a climber as well, you know, we all buy a place out here and we can live out here. Uh, and we actually have looked a few times, but I ended up in Boulder finally, so I'm close. Uh, and we moved there in May. Um, so tonight I'm going to tell you a Hubble story, but it's really a science story. It's about more than Hubble, uh, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But first, I'd like to show you what uh, what it looks like to see Estes Park from space. Give us a little context. So here's uh, Alice Park and Estes Park. Of course, you all can recognize all of that, right? You can find a lot of speed pretty easily. Um, I heard a little bit that earlier in the day. I think that uh, it's it's down here. Um, I think that's Meeker, uh, Lady Washington, and the lawns right there. But here's, here's uh, Estes Park, here's the reservoir, so we're right in there somewhere. Um, so that's sort of the astronaut's view. Of course, you can blow that picture up. And if you very carefully, you can see a big roller coaster up here. Okay. <laughs> Actually, you can't see a roller coaster. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> When I got to, uh, to NASA as chief scientist and then again as associate administrator, uh, I really struggled with the pithy statements that the communications people always would come up with to talk about what, what NASA's mission is. And so I came up with my own, because I could never remember uh, the longer ones uh, and, and what they were saying. So I had to have something, uh, and, and there's at least one member of the audience who will appreciate it, you know, that's so simple even an astronaut can remember it. And so I came up with this. NASA's mission is to innovate, and when you innovate, it gives you the tools to explore. Uh, when you explore, you discover things. And I think we're all wired uh, to you know, have a drive to discover. And then there's no point in going out and discovering things unless you can share that. And that's the inspiration. So innovate, explore, discover, and inspire. And so let's listen what I use as our mission statement. Uh, of course, the NASA Council said, well, it doesn't say space anywhere there. So how do we know that's NASA? I think it fits. And from a science perspective, and even for human space life, we're trying to answer really big scientific questions. Um, where did we come from? And where did the universe come from? How did the universe evolve to the point that it is the way we see it now? Where are we going? What's the fate of the universe? Where are humans going in the future? What's the trajectory of planet Earth? And these are all questions that NASA scientists and the NASA scientific community ask. And then the last one is what I've become a little bit preoccupied with lately, which is, are we alone in the universe? Is there life beyond Earth? Um, what's amazing is that even though these are you know, big philosophical questions as well as science questions, for the first time in human history, we have the technology and the means such that these are well-posed scientific questions that we can answer. And the Hubble Space Telescope plays a role on that. And why is it called the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, it's named after a very famous American astronomer, Edwin Powell Hubble, and you can see the dates that, that he lived, uh, and he was a real pioneer in astronomy at a time when we really had very little understanding of the universe. Uh, you know, this is uh, a time when Einstein was pondering the universe as well as many others, and it was assumed that the universe was infinite and unchanging for all time. You know, that was the prevailing view, that was the view of the church, uh, that was the view of, you know, of many, because it was inconceivable it could be otherwise. And at the time, uh, telescopes were evolving, there was actually kind of a, a big war about who could build the biggest telescope, and this is what uh, folks saw when they actually could use photographic emulsion looking at the sky, which kind of was the beginning of real science, when we could actually preserve an image 
where you can take long time exposures rather than drawing sketches. You know, drawing sketch, looking at an eyepiece and drawing a sketch, you know, is, is very satisfying, but it's not very scientific because the human brain and the hand and the artistic abilities of the astronomer biases that output, whereas you know, the camera doesn't necessarily lie. And now, this is actually a photographic <coughs> emulsion on a glass plate, and it's a negative because you know, that's how the solar iodide photographic process works. Um, and up in that corner, he's identified, Hubble has identified a variable star, it's a Cepheid variable. In this cloud of gas and dust, they thought, that they called a nebula. Now, fortunately we have Photoshop, so we can invert the image, so now it looks a little bit more familiar to some. Um, but at the time, they didn't realize what they were looking at. They thought these were clouds, nebula. Okay. The recognition that there was a variable star in that field uh, contributed to the recognition that this was not a cloud of gas. It was a cloud of stars. It was an island universe. Now, island universe isn't a very catchy name, so somebody came up with the word galaxy and that stuck, but they were actually observing galaxies. And there were very large collections of stars, innumerable, uncountable numbers of stars. And the interesting thing that Hubble saw is that because he could uh, identify that star, he could get the brightness of the star, they could use spectra to find out the velocity, and on average, he measured that all the galaxies are moving away from us. And this was a very startling discovery. Either we're at the center of the universe, and the center of the universe doesn't make a whole lot of sense, or all the galaxies are receding from us because the universe is expanding. And so he discovered you know, the expansion of the universe, which is pretty remarkable. Now fast forward to uh, today, and we now have the Hubble Space Telescope, whose one of its primary purposes was to actually measure that expansion of the universe in order to help date how old is the universe. So I'll tell you right now, the universe is about 13.7 billion years old, and we know that pretty accurately, 13.7, 13.8 maybe, depending on the measurement. But the Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched in 1990, is what's given us you know, so many answers. Uh, it was uh, to measure the expansion of the universe, the age of the universe, determine whether black holes exist, which it did, black holes really do exist. In fact, almost every galaxy has a massive black hole in its center. Uh, to learn about the life cycle of stars and to study planets in our solar system. So what's really incredible to me is that in a relatively short span of time, from the mid-1930s to the present, and, and much of it because of the Hubble Space Telescope, we can now tell the story of the universe from its earliest moments to the present from the Big Bang that sort of started it all, to the inflationary period where the universe grew just incredibly rapidly over just a fraction of a, a second, until matter became neutral, and then light didn't travel anymore uh, in the universe because if a photon was emitted from an atom, it would hit another atom before it could get very far. That's the dark ages. And we've seen this from the Cosmic Background Explorer and the Wilkinson Microwave Atomic Control. We've seen that background radiation. In fact, for those of you in the audience, and I, I suspect there's one or two, uh, when we had analog televisions, and you were between channels, and you, just, you saw the static on the screen, and you could hear the hiss, about half of that static is actually the microwave radiation left over from the Big Bang that pervades the universe. So we all, we all were watching uh, you know, the universe expand in real time. But from uh, the period where uh, stars started turning on, they re-ionized the universe. They stripped off electrons because of the starlight, especially the massive stars, like the one we just heard about, the A stars and B stars, um, and, and lots of supernova early in the universe. And they ionized the universe, which allowed photons then to travel. So from this, this, these first generations of stars to the present, the Hubble Space Telescope has allowed us to study you know, the origin of galaxies, the formation of galaxies, matter cycling in and out of stars, in galaxies, supernovas, black holes, the formation of cosmic structure by gravity, the influence of dark matter, which uh, is this exotic material, we still don't know what it is, but it dominates the ability of stru large-scale structures in the universe, the formations of, of stars and planets, and even of our own solar system, such that we can tell a pretty cogent story 
of the origin of the universe. We don't know what happened before or why it started, but the origin of the universe, the expansion, the formation of the solar system, the formation of our own galaxy, and even the formation and origins of the Earth. Now, we don't know how life got started. That's still a big mystery. A lot of ideas, um, something I'm very interested in. But I think it's remarkable that with a 2.4 meter telescope, which is not a very big telescope, orbiting the Earth, we've been able, and ground-based observatories too, we've been able to put this all together. Now, it really started with a fellow named Galileo, who didn't invent the telescope, but he's the first one to use it for astronomy. And people were looking on the horizon for ships, spying on their neighbors, who knows what. And nobody had really thought about using it to look in the heavens until Galileo. Now this is uh, March 2000, uh, May 2009, on the aft deck of uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis. You can see the Hubble in the background. And we actually had the privilege of carrying a replica telescope to Galileo. It was made with uh, glass from the same glass factory in Italy, from leather, from descendants of the cows and the leather that the telescope manufacturer used to make Galileo's telescope. The wood was from the same grove of trees, their descendants, of course, uh, and all done using the same hand grinding techniques and polishing and such that was used for Galileo's telescope. So I actually got to use this telescope on orbit. Uh, I observed Jupiter, and one thing I can tell you for sure is Galileo must have been a very patient observer, because this is a really lousy telescope. <laughs> very hard to look through. You have to be right in the center of the field where it's completely blurred out. Um, but pretty amazing with this little telescope uh, that he was able to discover you know, the Galilean moons, to observe the phases of Venus, to observe the moons moving around Jupiter, you know, which you know, meant that they don't go around the Earth, which was heresy, and of course he paid for that uh, you know, his whole life. But, the other thing is, this is too big to fit in any of our storage on the space shuttle. So we actually had to saw it. Space space space. <laughs> so as I was saying, you know, we had all of these really big telescopes that got up just you know, six feet across. Uh, and then eventually the telescope Mount Wilson that Edward Hubble used. But by this time, we transitioned from you know, the artist drawing the pictures and the astronomer's artist to photography. And that was that slide I showed you. And when that happened, you know, we went from Galileo's telescope, which was about 70 times better than just looking up with your eyeball in light collection. We've gone up, up to about 10,000 times, or, or almost 100,000 times, just because of the size of the telescope. But once we could do long time exposures, you know, that jumped up to millions and then billions times more sensitive than the human eyeball. But to put that in perspective, you know, here's what Hubble can do, the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, just off the scale. And then because we could put new instruments on Hubble, on this last service station, we brought up another order of magnitude. And so this is you know, really the power of uh, a small telescope by comparison to some of these others. But because it's above the Earth's atmosphere, it sees light that we can't see on the Earth. Ultraviolet light doesn't get through our atmosphere very well. So Hubble can see in the ultraviolet. But more importantly, uh, Hubble doesn't have the effect of the Earth's atmosphere it causes the images to be blurred. You know, star twinkles, not because stars twinkle, but because our atmosphere, aberrations, disturbances in the upper atmosphere causes stars to twinkle. So if you want a really sharp picture, you gotta be above the atmosphere. The other thing that it does is any mountaintop observatory has disturbance. Trucks drive by, airplanes fly nearby, there's an acoustic, earthquakes, the telescope itself grinding on its gears, working against gravity. Whereas Hubble above the atmosphere orbiting the Earth in free fall is essentially disturbance free. And so you get very, very clear images. But that was not always the case. When Hubble was first launched, um, um, this is the point where uh, I give Warren Schreiber credit for launching the telescope. Uh, and he's here in the audience. And actually, it was quite a feat. Uh, getting, getting Hubble to the launch pad, uh, and he and, and Charlie Bolden and Kathy Sullivan and Bruce McCandless and uh, Steve Hawley, uh, getting that telescope out of the payload bay, you know, that was no uh, easy trick, because Hubble is, is built to fill the shuttle, and there were a few problems getting it out. Um, but the first images were not great. Uh, and that's because the mirror was ground exquisitely 
the best mirror, the best surface finish, the best shape ever. It just happened to be the wrong shape. <laughs> and it was out of shape at the edge of the mirror by a tiny fraction of the width of the human hair. But that was enough that the images were not clear. They were out of focus. They were fuzzy. Spherical vibration is what it's called. And as a result, Hubble was not a great observatory. It was part of the great observatory problem. It was a good observatory, but we paid for a great observatory. Now, fortunately, uh, and this is a truly remarkable thing, you know, the visionaries who imagined the telescope knew that technology would march on, and by the time you launched the telescope, its cameras, imaging sensors, would be nearly obsolete. And so they designed the telescope and a lot of the electronics in the telescope to be serviceable. That means replaceable by humans in astronaut suits. And so the reason why Hubble has been so powerful is that after uh, Lauren Schreiber commanded the mission which launched the telescope, three years later we were able to go up and put in new optics and new instruments to correct that aberration. And ever since then, since 1993, Hubble has just been doing spectacularly. And in fact, the telescope is operating better now because of the error that we could figure out and fix than it would have if we'd launched it with the right mirror in the first place. I mean, truly phenomenal. And so we've done five servicing missions to upgrade and repair, put new instruments on, fix things that are broken uh, from 1993 to 2009. Um, I was, uh, at became an astronaut candidate and an astronaut in 1993. I worked a little bit on the first mission, first servicing mission, SM-1. Uh, I was going to the Mir Space Station around this time frame, so I wasn't involved in this mission. And then I flew on these last three missions, uh, over which I did eight spacewalks. So what I'd like to do now is tell you about the most recent mission. But I will say that after uh, our 2002 mission, uh, in 2003, we lost Space Shuttle Columbia, which is in fact the, the space shuttle that we launched that mission on. And that was a huge blow to me personally, a huge blow to, to NASA and all the folks on board who were friends of mine. Um, and there was a lot of question about whether we would ever fly shuttles again, whether we would fly shuttles just to finish the space station. And in fact, in 2004, uh, the then NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe announced that we would not go back to the Hubble for a final servicing mission. Uh, and that was a great disappointment to me for a couple of reasons, one of which I'm a Hubble hugger. Uh, two, I knew what we still had to do on Hubble to make it you know, superlative uh, that we've been working on. And three, at that time I was NASA chief scientist, uh, helping Sean O'Keefe in NASA science, but I was still an astronaut. I was on loan uh, to the administrator until we went to fly this mission, and then I'd go back to Houston and fly the mission. But it, you know, it was officially canceled, and so you know, all the crew assignments were cleared. And uh, I invented something called the Hubble Robotic Servicing Mission. Because I asked the question, well, if we can't go to Hubble with a shuttle, how can we go to Hubble? And so I, I made a t-shirt and wore it in one day, Hub, uh, Robot to the Rescue, <laughs> uh, and sold that. And you know, that appealed to the administrator because it got him out of kind of a jam. It would still allow us to go to Hubble. Uh, it would allow us to keep the contracts in place, and it would advance our robotics technology, which we needed for Moon, Mars, and beyond. Um, in 2006, John Keefe was replaced by Mike Griffin. Mike Griffin asked myself and another uh, fellow, Chuck uh, Shaw. Chuck Shaw was a flight director, but he was also the director of the Johnson Space Center Astronomy Club, uh, the president of the Astronomy Club. And uh, anyway, Mike Griffin, the NASA administrator, cast the two of us to figure out a way go back to Hubble safely, and we pointed out to the administrator that no space shuttle flights are safe. And he said, okay, well, try and make it as safe as our space station flights, and that's what we worked on. Uh, and then in October of 2006, he announced that we were gonna go back to the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, and he announced the crew that was gonna go. So uh, I had some input on this, but Scott Altman uh, was the commander of that mission, STS-125. This was his uh, fourth mission, his second mission, to the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, I went with him in the 2002 mission, uh, so he had some experience in Hubble, and I wanted that experience uh, team. Uh, and I think most of you actually have seen him in a, uh, a B-roll movie 
uh, because he uh, was the actual pilot flying F-104, I mean an F-1, F-14 Tomcat. Uh, and it, it's a movie that uh, was very popular at his time, uh, but never really amounted to much. And I can't remember the name of the actor that was actually flying the aircraft, but the movie was Top Gun. <laughs> and uh, Scott got paid for that film. I forget what it was, 15 bucks a day or something like that, because he had no speaking part. But he was actually flying all those scenes. Tom Cruise was not actually flying any of those scenes. But if you've seen the movie Top Gun, uh, you've seen, seen Scott Alpine. And in fact, there's one particular scene where the uh, protagonist puts out one individual finger, um, and, and there's that finger. So. <laughs> one finger on that hand, I won't specify. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's Scott Alpine, and he's just a great guy. Maybe at the time, Navy captain. Uh, he's now retired and works for uh, one of our contractors. Greg Johnson, also a Navy pilot, uh, attack pilot, and he was flying his first mission uh, to the Hubble Space Telescope, which is, which is pretty exciting. Megan MacArthur, an oceanographer, on her first mission, PhD oceanographer from Scripps, and she was also the robotic arm operator. Uh, Mike Massimino led one spacewalking team. He did two spacewalks on this mission. And Mike Massimino was on the previous mission as well. So his flight career has been two Hubble missions. Mike Good, uh, on his first mission, he's an Air Force aeronautical engineer, Air Force Colonel. Uh, myself, of course, I was on my uh, fifth mission. And Drew Foiskel, on his first mission, was my spacewalking partner. And Drew is now on the International Space Station. And he's just about to do his 10th lifetime spacewalk. Um, I taught him everything. <laughs> so he hasn't dropped anything in space, as far as I know. So here we are on the launch pad. Actually, one of our solutions was to have two space shuttles, one that we launched on, Atlantis, and another one, Endeavour, to rescue us in case something went wrong, as it did on Columbia. So here we are, walking up to the uh, launch pad. I wonder if I can turn up the line a little. We had to make sure we went to the correct space shuttle. <laughs> so that says Atlantis on the door there. Uh, we wear those orange suits. Uh, we call them pumpkin suits. They're pressure suits and parachutes. Honestly, those would make us feel better than when you jump out of the air. That's the idea. There are about 10,000 people that all have to do their job just right to get to the launch pad and of course to successfully launch. That's the launch director, Mike Lineman. About six seconds before launch, the main engines turn out. Once they're up to speed and we know they're good, the solid rocket flight. And once the solid rocket was like, you're going somewhere. You don't know where the computer knows where you're going. But it's really sort of Mr. Toad's wild ride at that point. Now that sound you heard is a master alarm. That's a bad thing. I'll tell you about that. The first couple of minutes we ride on the solid rocket motors, it's an incredibly rough ride. They come off. We actually have cameras on them now to watch for foam. Um, and those cameras aren't all the way until they splash into the ocean. Those boosters are reused. But here you can see we're continuing to orbit on a large liquid tank, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, for a total of eight and a half minutes to go from Kennedy Space Center to Earth orbit, uh, traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. Once we get there, we open the payload bay doors. They have, uh, for the thermal engineers in the audience, they have Freon running through them and fluid loops, and they're the radiators to get rid of all the heat that we generate inside of the space shuttle by the electronics. There's the tail of the orbiter, and inside is all the stuff we brought, the tools, the scientific instruments, the repairs, uh, equipment, replacement electronics, a special little uh, fixture to put Hubble on, and of course the Canada arm. Now that noise that we heard was a master alarm with liftoff. We have four flight control systems on the space shuttle, and one of them had failed. Uh, not such a bad thing. The shuttle designers were brilliant because they put four systems on it, so with one going down, we had three left. Uh, but it was just kind of startling because we don't expect an error in the first second. It turns out that actually the, the flight control system had failed several seconds before launch. Uh, random piece of solder or something, had fallen into a connector, shorted out the box, and, and had failed. But the designers were so clever that they realized that if the computer enunciated that a flight control system was failed, 
the, the commander might do something rash, like try and stop the launch. Which is actually what you know, we're trained to do. But not a couple of seconds before launch, because there's a chance that he would reach up and flip the switch that would cause the launch not to go. But the timing would be off, and the solid rocket motors would still fire, but the main engines would shut off. Well, the solid rocket motors, as I told you, once they light, they're going somewhere. They would go somewhere, and then leave the shuttle behind, uh, and the shuttle would fall over and blow up, and it would be very icky. So, um, so the engineer said, well, okay, we won't tell the crew that it's, it's failed. <laughs> when it fails, he said, well, when should we tell them? They said, well, how about liftoff? That sounds good. Now, for me, I would like to wait a few seconds, you know, get off the pad and say, okay, we're still alive. Anyway. Um, but that wasn't the first error. Subsequently, about 20 seconds later, I think, we had another alarm, and it was an indication that the center main engine was failing. Um, it was an H2 always pressure for Lauren. Well, where's Lauren? Okay. Anyway, so we, we had a, a hydrogen gas bulge, the pressure that pushing the hydrogen through uh, was going down pretty rapidly. And so on the crew, we were saying, this is not a good day. Um, we're going to do a return to launch site maybe, where everybody get their you know, books ready. Um, and we were just waiting for the call, and we reported it, and um, Greg Johnson, Fox Johnson, who was the Capcom, the person on the ground, he called me and he said, Roger, you know, no action. And we thought, okay, well, we just have to you know, make the burn off enough fuel so that we can do this risky maneuver where we get rid of the solid rocket motors, we turn around backwards, fly through our rocket exhaust, and try and power back to the Kennedy Space Center, dump the tank, and land. Um, and actually, the software does most of the work for you. Uh, so we used to train over and over again how to do this manually, and now the software takes care of most of it. That's the good news. The bad news is the engineers say, and we think it's about a 50-50 chance of success. <laughs> but that's not what I was thinking. I was thinking, I can't believe we've come this far, that Hubble was canceled, we've put the mission back on, we've trained, we've left the launch pad, and into orbit, and now we're not going to get to Hubble. And uh, anyway, so finally they told us to, to press to the next target, which is uh, called ATO, it doesn't matter. But we thought, huh, oh, what do they know we don't know? We got to orbit and we asked them, and they said, oh, it was a bad sensor. It's like, well, you could have told us that. <laughs> the ground sees three sensors, we only see one on board. Anyway, we made it to orbit, which is all good. That allowed uh, Scott Altman uh, to start working on the rendezvous with Hubble. Uh, we, we launched a little bit lower than Hubble, which means we're going a little bit faster. So over a couple of days, we catch up with Hubble to the point that Scott Altman can get right underneath the Hubble Space Telescope and then manually fly the last little bit right under the telescope to enable Megan MacArthur to reach out with the robotic arm and grab. Now, if you haven't gone to sleep yet, uh, I told you Megan's on her first flight. And her job is to grab the $8 billion Hubble Space Telescope uh, with the robotic arm, and if she bumps it wrong and it starts moving away, that's the end of Hubble. Hubble doesn't have enough capability to survive the next eclipse going around the back side, the shadow side of the Earth. Uh, so you have to grab it right the first time. It's a pretty high pressure event. Oh, and I, did I mention she's never flown the arm before? <laughs> because on the ground, we don't have an arm anymore. We used to have a hydraulic arm we could practice on. Now it's all done in a computer game. So a simulator. So all of her experience was in a simulator looking at computer screens, pretending she's flying a real arm, and now she's got to do the real thing on Earth. Now she did practice a little bit moving the arm around, uh, so, but uh, pretty high pressure, and uh, she's a tough cookie, and did a great job and grabbed it the first time. So we had a firm handshake with the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, put it into the payload bay, and that allowed us on the fourth day to get ready to go spacewalking. So here's Drew Foistel in his spacewalking pajamas, this is a special sort of uh, expando suit that's got all kinds of little holes in it, and through each hole uh, is about 200 feet of tubing, and we flow cold water through that tubing. That's how we keep cool inside of the spacesuit. Spacesuit is kind of a hard, bulky suit, so we have pads, and then these are air ducts to suck air in, and then it's circulated as cool air over the top of the helmet, over our faces, keeps the helmet from fogging up and keeps us cool. Uh, here's one of those helmets. Um, Mike Massimino has an instruction book, and it's really important in space and, and aircraft and other applications, probably medicine. Medicine hasn't quite caught up with this yet. 
Um, but uh, to use a checklist, you know, forget something. And it'd be a real shame to get ready to go to Hubble or get into your spacesuit and go outside, and then all of a sudden your glove pops off and you go, well, oh, I guess we missed that step right before you pass out and die. That'd be bad. Um, so we use checklists religiously, uh, and you can see it's quite thick. There's a lot of things, and I'll tell you more about that later. But we use a checklist to get dressed for spacewalking and, and all sorts of repair the whole space telescope. But you'll notice this is the, the space shuttle has an upper deck and a lower deck, and a flight deck and a mid deck. And this is the mid deck. You can see some lockers, that's where we store food and equipment and tools for Hubble, that kind of thing. And a lot of other junk. That's because we had seven crew members on board. We had four spacesuits, so that's like 11 people, spare parts. But we also had to carry you know, these huge bags filled with equipment to repair the shuttle in case something bad happened, like a piece of foam hit the leading edge of the wing, which is what broke on Columbia, you know, or other failures. And so we had all kinds of epoxy guns and leading edge segments and spare tiles, uh, blankets, a lot of duct tape, things like that in case something went wrong, as well as food, enough food to spend 25 days extra on orbit uh, in case we were stranded. So a lot of storage. So I was pretty happy to get my spacesuit and get out of that tight quarters and go for a walk. Uh, besides, I'm, I'm just always really happy to be in a spacesuit. I just feel like it's the coolest thing ever. So here, I'm in my suit. Here's Drew. Scott Altman, our commander, doesn't have a spacesuit. And all it takes is a couple of turns of that handle and all the air goes running out of that airlock. Now, now what we're actually doing is pre-breathing oxygen to purge all the nitrogen out of our bodies so that when we go up to, to the vacuum, uh, we don't get the vents, nitrogen uh, bubbles forming in our blood. And we did encourage Scott to go back into the uh, space shuttle and close the door. We opened the door and went out. And uh, so here I am outside now in a vacuum, not a, in a cloth suit, not exactly the same thing to do, but I'm loving it. Big smile. Here's an image of the Earth reflected in my visor. Here's the space shuttle wing. Uh, you can see uh, all my tools are tethered, otherwise uh, they, they can easily float away. Um, you can't quite see it, but here's a tether. So I'm tethered to the space shuttle so I don't float, float away. And I'm really happy to be back outside uh, in space, ready to go repair the hull, especially because the first day is one of the easiest days. We had five spacewalks, uh, and the primary function of this first spacewalk was to put in a new super duper digital camera into the Hubble that would unravel more mysteries in the universe than ever before. And it, it's a simple swap. It's a big camera, as you'll see, but there were just two bolts. One bolt disconnected a connector in the back, the other bolt released the camera. You pull out this big piano-sized object, you put in a new one, two bolts, and voila, you unravel the mysteries of the universe. That was the plan. There were a few other things. Anyway, so this is the only time I've been unhappy in space. Uh, that's me. That gives you a sense that the Hubble is bigger than a, a big bus. Here's the attachment to the space shuttle. And that's Drew Foistel fooling around with the wrench, uh, actually changing the bit. Because this is the old camera here, this sort of white box. It's a pie-shaped thing that goes into the telescope. And you can't get the bolt loose, the one that holds it into the telescope. And I'm unhappy because uh, I know how they designed it. They designed that bolt so that it would be torqued just the right amount. And if for some reason it got torqued too much, the shaft would break. They machined the shaft down narrow at one point so that it would break such that it would be permanently in the telescope. Because the alternative is it would break where the stress is the highest, which is where the threads are, and then you'd get this one out, but you couldn't get another one in, which would mean you wouldn't unravel further mysteries of the universe. But worse, there'd be a big gaping hole in the side of the telescope, and the telescope just simply wouldn't work. Thermal control, stray light, all those things. Uh, so they were smart. They designed it so that if you put too much force in trying to undo this bolt, it would just crack. Uh, now, of course, we're up there, the two of us, but we have five people inside the cabin uh, that, that can help us. And we also have a team on the ground. Hundreds of people, engineers, people who worked on the telescope, some who were even there when the telescope was originally built, people who were there when that old instrument was put in in 1993. So here we are, doing five miles a second over the Earth, not quite the uh, 
the speed of the wind from that star. Okay, here we go. And Drew's going to try and go for it. So you heard me say it turned, but what does that mean? Does that mean it broke or you know, that we were able to release it? Now, the fact that I'm here tells you the answer because if it broke, I'd have been in Bolivian exile or something like that. <laughs> I'd be able to set foot in front of my astronomy club friends here. Um, but fortunately, it, you know, it was successful, um, but we didn't know that at the time. So how do we know what to do? Well, the first thing we tried was a different wrench. We tried a different torque wrench. Each wrench has a torque limiter so we don't break it. And then finally, the step that you saw is get rid of all the torque protection and just go for it. And that's because all those steps were in the instructions in the part that's what to do when things go wrong. And the really skinny part is what happens when things go right. That's easy. <laughs> the big thick part of the book is what happens when things go wrong. And so Mike Massimino was inside reading those steps, because we didn't bring a big book outside you know, to read those steps. Um, but we also had help on the ground, as I mentioned. You know, so this is, uh, you listen to car talk, and clicking tap the tap the and that's what they call it. Hey, this is my problem. So we, you know, we it's like, like some of those game shows, you know, where you can call a friend. Okay, so now I sound happy. Well, that's about as happy as I am. <laughs> These are guys on the ground. It was tougher to do than we thought, but you know, they said it was just beautifully. Well, I just lost five years of my life, I think. That's Dave Lacron. He used to, was the Hubble Project scientist. And I think he really did lose, lose five years because he retired shortly after that. It was too much stress for him. But not until after we got the results from how Hubble was working. So that was pretty much it for that first day. On the second day, uh, Mike Massimino and Mike Good went out. They replaced the gyroscopes on Hubble. That's something that I had done in 1999. Uh, it's kind of cool because you get to go right inside the telescope. I felt like I didn't want Hubble. You know, the prime focus of the 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson, except for one thing, the door on the aperture of Hubble was closed, so I couldn't actually see through the telescope. That would have been really cool. Uh, they changed out some batteries. These are not AAA batteries. They're actually nickel hydrogen gas batteries. They weigh about 400 pounds. Uh, and it's amazing because every orbit they go through 16 deep cycles and charges. And these ones were up there for 19 years. That's pretty phenomenal technology. And now that we have new batteries up there, we should be able to do at least another 19 years, I think. Um, at least from a battery perspective. And of course, we never would go outside without our uh, alien space uh, lasers, <laughs> just in case. Uh, that's our power tool, and there's a sort of a standard uh, socket that we use. Most of the bolts on Hubble are in the same size socket, uh, and th this is a power tool, and it's a, called a line tool. It's basically like your power drill that you would get at the local hardware store. Uh, but it records every turn, every torque, every setting, so that on the ground afterwards we can figure out you know, how much torque was in each bolt. They didn't have that on that first service emission, and that's why they didn't apparently know how much torque was put into that one bolt. On the third spacewalk, uh, we went and changed out the uh, corrective optics that was put in in 1993 and replaced it with a scientific instrument. Uh, I convinced Drew to uh, work out in the gym every day for three years lifting weights. Uh, because this thing weighs about 800 pounds, the size of a refrigerator. But of course, in space, it's floating, and he's floating, so it doesn't weigh anything. But it does have mass, uh, and so if you get moving, you have to be strong enough to stop it as well. The other thing is, in these spacesuits, you know, it's a vacuum outside, there's practically no molecules at all, and inside, we have 4.3 psi pounds per square inch of pure oxygen, which means the spacesuit wants to be like this, but we want to be like this. So you actually have to do physical work. Do we have any physics teachers in the audience? <coughs> so the integral of FDX, work, you have to do continuously anytime you're moving your hands or your arms uh, to, uh, to work against the suit. So it is somewhat exhausting. So really, we spend a lot of time in the gym, both in endurance and strength. We have cameras on the top of our heads, so this is what you see. And this is uh, opening the doors on Hubble, so this is typical of how you get access to the scientific instruments. Here's Drew taking it out. You're going to see him give a thumbs up right there. 
Because every time in our training, in the water tank, we train in a large water tank for space, the thing would get stuck. So it's nice on the real day that it didn't get stuck. Now the next thing we did on the spacewalking day is the space first, is to repair an instrument in space, actually taking out cover plates, pulling out screws, pulling out circuit cards, putting new circuit cards in. Uh, nobody's ever done that uh, out working in the vacuum before. We had to because we didn't have the ability to uh, bring up a new instrument. And so here you can see the view from my helmet, removing number four torque set screws, little tiny screws. And how do you remove tiny screws in space? Well, with a tiny screwdriver, of course. <laughs> but we didn't want to lose any, so all I did was loosen them. And then I put this funny contraption on it, a uh, cover plate to remove the screws the rest of the way. If you look really carefully, you can see them floating around there. And that was to capture the screws. Uh, and then I had to have this other contraption to pull the cards out because the edge of the cards are very sharp and I didn't, nobody wanted to cut my glove, not Lisa, which is me. If you cut the glove, then all the oxygen leaks out and then I die, and then the telescope wouldn't be repaired. But we were successful in doing that. This was a task that uh, actually Lauren Schreiber's pilot on the deploy mission, Charlie Golden, was the chair of a review team. And he said, don't try that repair because uh, it won't work. It'll take too much time. Uh, and there are more important things to do. But uh, we, we persevered and figured out ways to do it. And it was predicted to take two and a half hours. I trained really hard and learned all this task and developed new tools. It took two hours and 32 minutes. And so you can see when I came in, I was extraordinarily tired, um, but, but very, very happy. It's a lovely day for a launch here of I of Cape Canaveral, the lower end of the Florida Peninsula. And the purpose of today's mission is truly, really electrifying. That's correct, Tom. The lion's share of this flight will be devoted to the study of the effects of weightlessness on tiny screws. Unbelievable. Just imagine the logistics of weightlessness. And of course, this could have literally millions of applications here on Earth. Everything from watchmaking to watch repair. <laughs> that's, that's a Simpsons episode that aired about 10 years before our flight. And it's amazing how the writers were able to anticipate the amazing feats of space flight so far in advance. Uh, then on our fourth spacewalk, uh, we put in, uh, we did another repair. Uh, this one had its trials and tribulations. Uh, Mike Massimino taking out tiny screws, um, and he inadvertently stripped some other screws before he got started. So about four hours, we were just waiting, trying to come up with an idea. And finally, the ground said, well, it was a handrail that was, he was trying to remove. He said, can you break it off? And uh, in the cabin, I told Scooter, uh, Scott Altman, I'm sure at this point he can break it off. He <laughs> said about 60 pounds of force, and so he was able to break that off, and then uh, over the next couple of hours, we were able to repair the other instrument that we were working on. Finally, on the fifth spacewalk, um, that's me replacing the fine guidance sensor, which is another uh, scientific instrument that also helps the telescope point. Drew is now the free floater. Uh, we also put in new batteries. We put new insulation on the outside of the telescope and a couple of other tasks to finish off the day. And then finally, uh, the next day, Megan MacArthur reached out and grabbed the Hubble again, lifted it up, and then Scott Altman fired the rockets for the shuttle to back away from the Hubble. And actually, the, the Hubble goes over the windows that are in the top of the flight deck, just, just a, about six or eight feet above the cabin. And I've now seen this three times. Everybody ducks. <laughs> like, really? But that's uh, just, you know, instinct. And so we watched Hubble. Oh, one thing I want to mention here is we actually put on, this is the very first task I did on the first day. We put a little ring on the bottom of Hubble that hadn't been there before that has three pedals. And that's so that some future robotic mission, this was one of the challenge, could go up, or maybe an Orion spacecraft, and dock to the bottom of Hubble without needing that big space shuttle space in the robotic arm. So it is possible to go back to Hubble again, maybe in the early 2020s. But we watched Hubble float away, uh, wave, took pictures, and eventually Hubble went up into the shadow around the Earth, and that was the last we saw of it. Now that gave us a chance just to relax, have a meal together, because we were working so hard before that. I like to hang upside down like a bat. <laughs> this is Drew making a sandwich. It's actually a chicken a tortilla with chicken on it. We have tortillas instead of bread because bread makes bread crumbs, which is a snowstorm. Tortillas hold together. 
So I, I encourage any of the young people in the audience, please try this at home. <laughs> See if the tortilla always lands chicken down. <laughs> My son, uh, who was pretty young at the time, asked uh, if I would take a picture of a ball of water floating in the cabin, which I did. And I took a, a series of them, and then I said, hey, I realized it's a convex lens. So I said, Drew, get behind the, uh, the ball of water. And I focused the camera on the image. His nose really isn't that big. And sure enough, it's inverted and, and magnified. I thought that was pretty cool. And I said, Drew, get really close. And then the ball of water touched him, and surface tension caused it to, to flare out around his face. I don't know if it's One of the most fun things to do is to look out at, at planet Earth. I'm never tired of that, day or night. Um, and you know, I try to find some of the star pictures. One of the things I like to do is I put a hood over a window so that we're on the shadow side of the Earth. I take uh, time exposures, uh, and, and that was a pretty neat thing to do. Uh, on my fourth mission, I held a little star party on the flight deck. I brought up the crew members and we darkened the cabin. Uh, unfortunately, night at the Hubble orbit is only about 35 minutes long, so you have to be quick because it takes about 30 minutes to darken up the eyes. And I was pointing out various things, Colsec Nebula, uh, the Southern Cross, the Large Magellanic Cloud. And then I said, oh, I thought I cleaned the windows pretty well. And I said, oh, there's a smudge. And I started cleaning the window, and I stopped, embarrassed, and I said, and there's the small Magellanic Cloud. <laughs> I've never actually seen that before. But this is a, a picture of the daytime, obviously. The coast of Africa runs along there on the lower left. You can actually see one of the Cape Verde Islands. And these islands are causing the, the winds, which are pretty low level, to create these wonderful von Karman vortices. Basically, the, the wind spins the clouds around as they go over the islands. And you can see that going on for hundreds of kilometers. Um, I carried a very special camera on this mission as part of the, the kit, official kit that we're allowed to carry you know, memorable items. And this is a 1929 Zeiss Icon Max MRB camera. Originally it had plates uh, for film. Um, my very first uh, expedition on eBay was to find a film bag of 120 roll film to adapt it, which I was able to find. It took a couple of buys to get one that would fit uh, and then uh, in the machine shop I could adapt. But I wanted to actually use this camera on orbit. And this camera uh, belonged to a friend of mine, uh, Brad Washburn, who's a very famous mountaineer, explorer, and the uh, director of the Boston Museum of Science for 30 years. And this was his pocket camera, uh, and was used on a climb of Mount Lucania in the uh, Canadian Rockies, uh, near the, the border with Alaska. And uh, he and a buddy, uh, well, Brad Washburn pioneered aerial photography of, of the Mount Creek mountain ranges. Um, and uh, was one of the folks who was on a Swiss expedition in the Learjet to map Mount Everest. We have a Mount Everest somewhere in the audience um, and, and made a model of that. But Brad carried this camera on the Mount Lucania, which is about 17,000 feet expedition. The first, they're not the first attempt, but it was the first ascent when we did it. But the, uh, the pilot who flew them in on a ski plane, it was an expedition of four people, they shoveled all their equipment and had 3,000 pounds of gear on the glacier. And then they took Brad and Bob Bates and his climbing partner, dropped them off on the glacier, and they were going to go back for the other two climbers, a party of four. And the pilot got stuck on the glacier because the snow was soft. And it took a week to dig it out and make multiple tries. And finally, uh, the pilot threw everything out of the plane. They already used up most of the fuel. Uh, you know, I, I, I sort of feel like he was probably you know, taken off in his underwear to the way that makes their clothes off. But anyway, he was frightened of crevasses and sure the plane was going to fall in the crevasse, but finally he was able to take off and Brad and Bob H. Washington take off and then drop over the edge of the glacier. And they sort of cringed waiting for the, the boom and then they saw the plane slowly climb away. And the last thing that he told them before he left was, I'm not coming back for you. <laughs> They're on their own. That was about 80 miles down to Valdez where they took off on a really ugly glacier, totally crevasse glacier, or they could climb up the mountain they planned to over the other side and down and a shorter path to a trading post called Burwash Landing. And so they decided to climb anyway. They were there, they had all the gear, they were young. Uh, now, Brad's wife, Barbara Washburn, also a mountaineer, was sort of waiting for news of them, and all she knew is that they had been delivered and that was sort of the end of them. But this camera 
uh, took pictures along the ascent and over the other side, along with notebooks. And finally, though, they got to the other side and the cache of food they were counting on from a previous expedition had been destroyed by bears. Not a big surprise, actually, when you think about it. And uh, so they didn't have the food they expected, and the conditions walking out were just horrible. Uh, and so at one point, Brad uh, hung the camera up on a tree, and they threw our page out of the notebook and wrote a note, uh, and put the notebooks in a bag, and said, you know, whoever finds this will know of our fate. And they pushed on, uh, expecting not to make it. Um, well, a couple of days later, uh, some random trader was going through the hummocks of uh, tundra where they were, and all they saw were these little donkey ears going by, and they knew they were safe, and they went and picked up the camera, uh, and the pictures were developed, and, and uh, it's a great story. Dave Roberts wrote a book about it, if you want to uh, read it called The Escape of the Teeny. But anyway, that camera is the camera that Brad took. Um, he passed away in 2007, I think, February 2007. Actually, I was on a uh, peak in South America called Aconcago when he passed away. And so I called uh, his wife and his family and said, Barbara, is there something in Brad's I can take with me on this mission to memorialize him? Um, I have no idea what they come up with. They came up with this camera, and so I was actually able to take pictures of it. And all I can say is Brad was really an expert photographer because it was very hard to use. But uh, here's a picture of, uh, actually it's Arizona, New Mexico, a little bit of Utah, and Colorado. And so we're somewhere up in here. That's probably Long's Peak right there. Maybe it's not happening. Anyway, something like that. So this is a picture with that 1929 slice icon Maxim RV. Now back to the Nikon modern camera, electronic camera. This is a picture of a sunrise. And so my technique here was before sunrise, you can look out the window and you can see these wonderful colors of our atmosphere. And there's actually you know, very distinct color layers. That's about 100 kilometers total. So the little thin orange one is kind of the habitable part of our atmosphere. Um, and I would just take the shutter and click until the sun came up. And once the sun comes up, it's too bright to look out the window anymore. And eventually I got you know, a few good pictures. This is after we got rid of Hubble. Here's the arm parked, the maneuvering pods with the engines for the shuttle, uh, the gear, the tail of the shuttle, uh, and we're ready to come home. Now, we were ready to come home after all of that, but the weather in Florida was terrible. And they told us we had to stay up an extra couple of days. Oh, darn. Um, I'd love in space if I could. Much happier space than I am on planet Earth. While they're driving down the hill coming into the valley here, uh, I was pretty happy. It's very beautiful. Way to live. So we had a couple of days to fool around. Uh, this I call feeding the fish. These were the, the rookies. Those are uh, peanut MMs. Uh, I switched to orange drink for the balls. That actually is tang, in case you're wondering. Here's another water ball. Mike Butter's going to take care of that. Now, we also did some physics experiments. This is the uh, stability of rotation about various axes of a solid body. <laughs> uh, we did this as a short educational video. And conservation of angular momentum. Now, while we were in the mid-deck doing physics experiments, uh, Scott Altman, Ray, uh, Greg Johnson, and Megan were up on the flight deck playing video games. This is the Land of the Space Shuttle video game. It's actually a pretty high fidelity simulator of the landing, final phases of landing the space shuttle. Because for 10 days, Scott had not been practicing landing the space shuttle. We wanted them all to be sharp. Uh, they told us, uh, forget about Florida, which we knew. We, like, we don't have windows. You know, we could see the big storms. And uh, we were sent to California, Edwards Air Force Base. And so Scott put his California tunes on. Uh, Megan said, get to work. Uh, and so we did, we got our suits on, uh, we did our gear with burn helmets on, and so now we're encased in this 2,000 degree plasma, basically knocking the electrons off of the gas in the atmosphere as we come in and slow down. Um, we free fell for about an hour, hit the top of the atmosphere, so to speak. 40 minutes later, we were a glider. Uh, we see the runway, we're doing about 350 miles an hour at 12,000 feet, 21 degrees nose down. And this is viewed through the heads up display. There's the runway, runway 22 at Edwards Air Force Base. At uh, 300 feet, command the landing gear down, which is good. There's no going around, this is it. And it's got beautifully uh, put space shuttle land system right in the middle of the runway. Uh, we put out a, a parachute. That's actually so the nose gear doesn't hit as hard. You can see where that's located. We have great brakes, so it's, it's not really for braking. But we roll to a stop. Uh, plenty of runway left.
get rid of the chute so it doesn't tangle up the engine. This was supposed to be the last flight of Atlantis. Atlantis actually, she flew one more time. But we rolled through the stop. I think we traveled about 5.6 million miles, 197 orbits in the Earth. We grabbed Hubble, we did five spacewalks, we let go of Hubble, uh, and we successfully made it back to Earth. <laughs> So we survived, but did Hubble. Uh, when I was teaching the other spacewalkers how to, to work on Hubble, uh, the first rule was be safe. That's always the first rule. Don't bring anything down. Uh, the second rule is don't break the Hubble. And the Hubble was designed to be serviced, but it wasn't designed to be kicked you know, or manipulated in ways that could hurt it. Uh, and so at this point, we don't know whether we fixed Hubble or whether we broke Hubble. And it would be a little while before we know that. Now, once again, you know that we didn't break the Hubble, and otherwise I wouldn't be here talking about that. <laughs> Beware of being in Bolivia in exile, which is code for climbing, by the way. <laughs> um, I don't think they have extradition, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, so we did fix the hull, and so maybe if we can bring the house lights down somewhere, you don't need to see me, you've seen me enough. Um, if you would, thank you. So you can see the Hubble pictures. Um, the camera, you probably know this, but the camera on your smartphone uh, has three cameras built in. Every pixel is actually three cameras. There's a red, green, and a blue pixel, and it simultaneously takes those three pictures in every pixel, and then the computer and your camera puts those together to make the nice photos. Hubble is a monochrome camera, black and white camera, so to speak. What it does is it takes serial pictures one at a time with filters that give it the color, selects the color, blocks up the light. So it takes a picture of some fuzzy object in red, and green, and blue, with a wheel that actually puts a filter in front of the camera. And sometimes, in this case, H-alpha, which is a line of emission of hydrogen, another red core, because that's the science. And then you take those images, combine them, and you get the beautiful Hubble images. So this is the spiral galaxy. It has about 50 billion stars in it. There is a black hole at the center of it, on spiral arms. And these bright regions are star-forming regions where baby stars are being born. Most of the uh, A and B stars, and some O stars, that are these very bright stars that last only a few million years and then go supernova. Um, and so there's shocks going through these spiral arms, causing the gas to collapse, causing stars to form. Uh, so we knew that how it works. Now, the new camera has much better resolution than the old camera. And so it makes these beautiful pictures. This is a, a cloud of gas and dust that's collapsing. Um, and so that's what you see here. And, and there's uh, hydrogen, oxygen. Uh, this is actually taken in uh, the light glowing of oxygen, nitrogen, and a couple other gases. Uh, but we can't see into the middle of it. But because we see jets of material coming out, uh, we know that a baby star is being born inside of this cloud of gas and dust, called the Herbig Harrow object, for those that are experts. But we know there's a baby star inside. Now, outside, there's other stars that were born recently, and they produce a lot of ultraviolet light. And from the outside, they're boiling off this dense cloud of gas and dust. And from the inside, that new star is making a bubble. And eventually, this will disappear and the star will emerge, and we'll be able to see it from Earth. But one of the things we did was to put two cameras in the new uh, instrument that we installed, one of which is an infrared channel. An infrared light has the property that it can sneak through the dust grains that block our view. And so here's the infrared view. So this is a new capability for Hubble. So there's that baby star. Here's the jets. We know that it's rotating in and out of the plane, causing the jets to go out into the poles. And you can kind of see a little bit of the bubble, and of course the ghostly outline of the nebula. So this is an amazing new capability that we have with Hubble. It also gives us a preview of what we'll be able to see with the James Webb Space Telescope. Now the other thing that Hubble can do in the infrared is to see very deep into the universe. And so with this new camera, we used it to, uh, to do another Hubble deep field. And this is where we stare at one region of space, just the size of a soda straw, uh, held at arm's length, looking through a soda straw, but for a really long period of time, so we can collect photons. And because of the expansion of the universe, light from a distance galaxy gets stretched out as the universe expands, and if the wavelength 
stretched out, that means it goes more towards the red. And so with this new infrared camera, we set the record on the oldest galaxy. And this is a galaxy, believe it or not, it's not a great image, but of course, you know, it's as the universe was 13.3 uh, billion years ago. And so this is a baby galaxy, or a toddler galaxy. It's at a redshift of 11.1 as the universe was when it was only 400 million years old. And how can we see back in time? It's because it's taken uh, all that 13.3 billion years for the light to get to us, even traveling at the speed of light. Uh, for this, uh, uh, the, by measuring the lots and lots of galaxies, uh, Adam, Adam Reese, uh, Saul Perlmutter, and Brian Schmidt won the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics, studying these very uh, early galaxies and many others, looking at supernova to determine the expansion rate of the universe. That was the other thing I told you about Hubble was designed to do. And to their great surprise, they found that not only is the universe expanding, but it's accelerating. And this was something nobody expected. We expected either the universe was slowing down because all the gravity, all the stars pulling against each other would cause it to slow down, or that it would uh, be just uh, expanding at sort of a constant rate, that was another possibility. Um, unfortunately, this tells us about the history of the universe in the future. Uh, because it's not accelerating, it's probably going to continue to accelerate forever, and so eventually the universe is going to become dark again. But it's very exciting because what's driving that acceleration, nobody knows. And we don't see what's causing it either. It's some kind of hidden energy in the universe. And so it's been called dark energy. So now there are some really big mysteries. It turns out that dark energy accounts for about uh, almost three quarters of the total energy in the universe. And dark matter is about 20%, and we're only about 4%. So 96% of the universe is filled with stuff and we have no idea what it is. And so I think that's pretty exciting. A lot of science to be done. This is from uh, Adam Reese's notebook. Uh, He's measuring these uh, uh, velocities, computing the acceleration, and there's a parameter that's supposed to be positive, which is kind of the uh, deceleration component, and it was negative. And he did this over and over again, and came up with the same answer. Uh, and that means it's not decelerating, it's accelerating. Now, if you go out tonight, I hope you look up at the sky first thing. You know, I was telling an astronomer when they walk out of the building at night, they look up. Because um, Mars is high in the sky, well, not that high here, but it's uh, very bright. We had a uh, opposition where it was about as close as it gets, just in July. But it's still really easy to see. And this is uh, an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, these dots are not here, that's an artifact of the projector. Um, but you can see that Mars is actually a planet a lot like Earth, and that it has polar caps, it has clouds, it has a very thin atmosphere much thinner than Earth, it's only a fraction of a percent. But uh, we have a rover on the surface of Mars now, and I talked to you about that big question, are we alone? And the rover has seen some really interesting things. It's Curiosity, that's a she, she has a Twitter account if you want to follow her. And uh, one of the instruments on the Curiosity rover is a mass spectrometer which can analyze molecules. We've been grinding up rock, putting it into a mass spectrometer, and lo and behold, uh, in this crater, that has told us that Mars was once warm and wet, had puffy clouds, snow-capped peaks, rivers, lakes, salty seas. About 3.8 billion years ago, Mars was definitely a happening place. Um, it's dried out now. But uh, in that rock that we've been grinding up, we've been finding organic molecules. And we're scratching our heads where it could come from. We're also detecting methane gas, seasonal. Um, now on Earth, significant fraction of the methane on Earth comes from cows. We haven't seen any cows on Mars. <laughs> Another significant fraction is just natural from geochemical processes. Uh, we have a lot of hydrocarbons in the ground and it seeps out. Or in the case of the plains to the east of here, we drill and release it uh, in our hunt for oil. Uh, Colorado's a little better than some states, but uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, but a lot of the, the other methane that's naturally occurring comes from microbes. So I, I won't rule out that if life started on Mars 3.8 billion years ago when it was a happening warm, wet place, 
that it might still survive well under the soil where there's still ice and water and rock. Um, so there's a possibility that there's life on Mars. We may find out in the next 10 years or so. Another place, and this is actually my, the scientific work I'm doing now, uh, is this is an image of Europa from the Galileo mission, superimposed on an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is the background, and with Hubble, we're seeing a plume of material coming out of the side of Europa. Now, Europa is a planet, uh, a moon of Jupiter, it's the second Galileo moon in, and it's an ice ball. It's about the size of our own moon, 3,000 kilometers, it's got an icy crust that's between five and 30 kilometers thick, underneath of which is a great salt ocean with about twice as much water as we have on planet Earth, salty water. Uh, and Galileo determined that it is in fact salt water. And it's uh, about 100 kilometers deep, and then there's a rocky core. And that core is heated by tidal forces from Jupiter that keeps the ocean warm, but on the outside it's cold enough that it's just that big solid of ice. And there's something you'll notice about uh, Europa that's kind of unique among solar system objects uh, that don't have atmospheres, is you don't see very many craters. And what that means is, and it gets bombarded all the time by big things, what that means is this is a very young surface. You see all these cracks and things and crevasses. That means that this is an active surface. Every 50 million years it has to reinvent its surface by some means, and myself and others think that one of the processes is that these plumes exist and material water from the ocean comes out, freezes, and then lands on the surface to resurface it. But if these plumes are actually coming from the ocean and we could fly through those plumes, we would have access to any life that might be in the oceans. And so if life on Earth started at the bottom of the oceans, as many scientists think, biologists think, but it took billions of years to get kicked off, Europa's had 4.8 billion years with a warm, salty, soupy ocean filled with organics for life to start. Uh, do we think there's life there? We have no idea. But we can go and find out. In fact, there's two NASA missions, um, and I'm working on a third that maybe you can, can go find out uh, if there's life by flying through the plumes and looking for signs of organics. Now we talked about Orion earlier. Uh, this is the uh, middle bright object in the sort of Orion. This is Orion's nebula, taken with Hubble. And again, this is a region of gas and dust where there's collapsing going on, and baby stars are being born in this dark region. And these are you know, new stars, just millions or tens of millions of year old that have turned out. But it highlights what I think is one of the contributions, if not the greatest contribution, of Hubble. And it's not the discovery of acceleration that's scientifically incredible. Um, it's not the existence of black holes, which is also scientifically incredible. Uh, and all the other great science that, that Hubble has been doing. But it's that Hubble has shown us uh, much more than any other observatory, really for the first time, that the universe is much more beautiful than we ever imagined. And it took the power of Hubble to do that, and, and really these new cameras, that for the first time we're seeing the universe and things like Orion Nebula with the same kind of resolution that we see our earthly world here with our own eyes. And so it's opened up our eyes to the beauty of the universe. And I think that's a pretty significant contribution in its ability to inspire. Now these are baby stars. Uh, at the end of life of stars, uh, stars like our own sun, they're going to run out of fuel and they're going to get very angry. They're going to get hangry. And when they get hangry, they're going to blow off their outer layers. And, it, and the sun will swell up to be a red giant eventually. Uh, with the Earth inside of the star, we'll, we'll be burned up long before then. That's why we need human space flight to go find another home. But not to worry, we got a few billion years to worry about it. We have much more pressing problems right now. But this is what happens to a star like our own uh, as it gives up its light. And it ejects a lot of the heavy material that it built up in its stellar furnace over time. Um, and then eventually it will sort of whimper out and become uh, a white dwarf and will live for a very long time uh, in retirement. <laughs> but again, in this quest for the search for life in the universe, what's fascinating is we see in molecular clouds, in the Orion Nebula, we see in cold gas, we see in comets, we see in meteorites, all of the ingredients that you need to make life. We see amino acids, 
We see all kinds of organic molecules, we see various hydrocarbons, all the things that you would want if you wanted to create a cell. Um, but we also, to account for how we got here, we need a lot of heavy elements. We need iron in our blood, we need calcium in our bones, we need zinc to prevent colds, kind of But anyway, to make enzymes, you know, we're, we rely on these heavy elements. And a, a normal star doesn't make those heavy elements. They make hydrogen, helium, up to iron, and that kind of stops. So to account for these other things, like this little bit of selenium that we need, uh, we had to go through supernova explosions. And so we've been processed, this is a whole range of supernova <laughs> explosion in America. We've been processed through about two and a half to three supernova explosions to account for the elemental abundances on Earth of all these heavy metals. And so all you gotta do is look at your vitamins, you know, the calcium, the iodine, you know, the zinc, selenium, copper, these things, um, the lithium, uh, you know, stuff like boron, that's built in regular stars, but the nickel, come from vanadium, they come from a supernova explosion. So I think, you know, it's pretty cool that it's, it really is true that we are star stuff, that we are made out of materials from stars, not only that, from supernova explosions. Okay, looking towards the future, uh, you know, the Hubble hopefully will last, you know, through the early 2020s, but eventually something, you know, is going to break, run out, the gyros are going to fail. Right? And unless we go back and service Hubble, we're going to lose Hubble. So we've invented the James Webb Space Telescope, going where no Hubble has gone before. Of course, you need that being from Star Trek to uh, play your hand. Um, you've probably heard about delays in the James Webb Space Telescope, but we really are working as fast as we can. Now, this is a real-time video of engineers working on the James Webb Space Telescope. We're trying to get it off of planet Earth as soon as we can. Um, unlike the uh, Hubble, the James Webb Space Telescope is not on a single mirror or two, but it's built up of a series of segments of mirrors, each of which are a few feet across. It's gold because it's an uh, infrared telescope. Um, and we were all set for launch in uh, 2018. Uh, until we delivered the uh, spacecraft to North Brunswick, the telescope, this is at the Goddard Space Flight Center, telescope to North Brunswick, uh, and then it kind of ground to a halt with a series of problems. So it looks like uh, late 2020 or early 2021 now, the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. But we're really looking forward to that nonetheless. It's going to be a fantastic telescope. It's about 20 feet across, uh, you know, compared to Hubble's, you know, under 10 feet across. And so it's going to show us. Uh, the very first stars and galaxies in the universe as we came out of the dark ages so that we can see if that's really how the universe originated. We're gonna be able to look at the assembly of galaxies through cosmic time. We're gonna be able to look into the places, as I showed you, where stars and, and planets are born. And we're actually gonna be able to study planets around nearby stars and study their atmospheres to see what those planets have in their atmospheres. The Kepler telescope has already told us, and the, a new one we just launched last year, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, uh, are gonna completely revolutionize our knowledge of our background, of our neighborhood. Uh, but Kepler has already shown us uh, over 4,000 planets in one small region of our galaxy around other stars. Uh, Tess will find probably hundreds of thousands, and maybe millions, of our nearest neighbors. Uh, so this is the field of exoplanets, and it's very exciting. What's even more exciting is folks who predicted what we would find in planets said, oh, we're gonna find a lot of Jupiters, a lot of Neptunes, they're probably the most common planets uh, that we'll find. And it turns out that Jupiters and Neptunes and Saturns are rare. And that planets around the size of Earth and a little bigger are the most common. Which is sort of the standard thing. Scientists always say, oh, well, those things are really common. We're rare, we're special. And then we find out, you know, we're at the center of the universe. Well, no. We're at the center of the solar system. No. We're at the center of our galaxy. No. Uh, yeah. We're still pretty special. This is the only place we know in the universe that has life. Um, but we're getting closer, and it, it's helpful that there's lots and lots of rocky planets. Now, we don't want any rocky planet. Mercury is a rocky planet. Uh, but it's, it's not doesn't harbor life. We want planets that are in the zone where liquid water can exist. And in our solar system, with our color and temperature of sun, that extends from roughly Venus to Mars. In principle, Venus could have water, but it's too hot, uh, too high pressure. And Mars did have water, but it was too small, so it lost that water to space. 
other than what's frozen underneath the ground. And we're sort of right in the middle, right? The middle of that Goldilocks zone. Uh, but we're seeing lots of other solar systems that have areas with planets inside, one of which is called Gloria's name, Kepler 452, and the second planet that was discovered is actually in its, it's a little bigger than Earth, but it's in its habitable zone, and its sun is a lot like ours. It's a little bit older, a little bit hotter, but um, it's much like ours. And then there's these little teeny solar systems around the red dwarfs, and we're seeing lots of those, and there's rocky planets about the size of Earth in a zone where liquid water could exist on the surface. The next step is to say, okay, that's theoretical. Let's observe those planets. That's what the James Webb will start to do, but we'll need other telescopes. And what we want to do is break up the light from the atmosphere of that planet into its component colors to generate a spectrum of light. So a wavelength goes this way, intensity goes that way. And the wiggles that you see are characteristics of atoms and molecules in the atmosphere that we'll be able to detect. Now we've actually, with Hubble, studied the atmospheres of of gas giants around other stars. And we've seen evidence of water vapor, we've seen sodium, we've seen you know, signs of other gases. But if there's life on the planet, uh, we should be able to measure uh, oxygen through ozone lines. If there's vegetation, we might see features there. We should be able to see water vapor, signs of carbon dioxide, signs of methane, signs of other things. And if there's some alien intelligence 30 light years away from us with a big telescope, looking at us, they'll also see trace pollution in our atmosphere. Um, so they'll know that there's industrial life, not just microbial life, but industrial life. Uh, unfortunately, they'll rule out intelligent life, but that's a whole <laughs> discussion. <laughs> but to find out whether our neighbors have uh, atmospheres with signs of life, even microbial life, we're going to need a bigger telescope <clears throat> than even the James Webb Space Telescope. And so one study I was involved with imagine something like a super James Webb, uh, just much bigger. This is an image from a spacecraft called the Deep Space Climate Observatory. It's between Earth and the Sun looking back at the Earth. Uh, and it shows our Earth and our Moon. And it, it, it's just an inspiring picture, and it, and it makes me want to imagine a moment when we have that big telescope, when we observe that atmosphere of a planet around a nearby star, or when we fly through a plume of gas and water on Europa and discover life, discover either evidence of microbial life on Europa or signs of you know, vegetation or some signs of life on another planet or another star. Uh, but that will just be a phenomenal moment. Uh, and so when you go out tonight and look at the night sky, assuming it hasn't clouded up, and I think that's very unlikely, um, now you're, you're in Estes Park, you're going to see a lot of stars. Virtually every star you see in the night sky has a solar system around it. Uh, and, and probably 20% of those stars has a rocky planet uh, that's you know, about the size of Earth or close to Earth. Uh, how many of those that are in the zone of liquid water, I can't tell you yet. We'll find that out soon. Um, but it's pretty amazing how far we've come, at least when I was a kid looking up, wondering whether there were even other planets out there. So with that, I'll sort of come to a close. Of course, you can go to worldwideweb.nasa.gov and find out more. A lot of social networking cool tools, uh, some of which work with the current OS, some of them don't. Um, we've just launched you know, a bunch of really cool missions. We have an asteroid mission that's just about to get to the asteroid that I knew. And it's going to actually land and grab a piece of it and bring it back to Earth. The Parker Solar Probe just launched uh, to uh, get about as close to the sun as you can get without burning up. Uh, folks ask me, well, how do you do that? I said, well, we go at night. <laughs> but it has amazing heat shield, amazing instruments. We're going to learn so much about the solar phenomena. Uh, we just launched a mission to, called ISAT-2 to study the ice in Greenland and Antarctica and also sea level. Uh, really amazing things going on across the spectrum of NASA science. And as I said, Drew Foistel is still in space with Ricky Arnold and, and cosmonaut friends uh, doing great things on the International Space Station. So with that, I'll call oh, a few have like way too much discretionary time. Um, although I, honestly, since November 2016, I stopped tweeting, but I do have a Twitter account called SciCaster. Thank you very much. Who actually shuts it down, do we just leave?